All right, I wanted to give you a little uh, introduction here to uh, Chapter 7, which focuses on deviance. So deviance is one of these interesting concepts in sociology. It's where we start looking at um, norm breaking. So someone who is deviant is breaking a norm. Now, we oftentimes think of crime, which is why I have the gun and bullets here, kind of the extreme cases. But anything can be deviant that's breaking any rule of society or norms of society. So, um, you know, running down the hallway yelling um, is deviant. Then you're probably not going to get arrested for it, um, but people will react to it. So let me show you here, I'm going back to um, one of the most important concepts of deviance is that it's not the act itself, but the reaction to the act that makes something deviant. This is from Howard Becker, an American sociologist, and it really is the heart of how sociologists look at deviance. In other words, um, something isn't naturally or inherently deviant. Uh, take an extreme example like murder. Murder is deviant not because it in and of itself is deviant, but because people react to it they let you know that it's deviant. So, you know, if, if someone kills someone, you know, the cops will be chasing them. Uh, more than likely, eventually, they'll be arrested and convicted of a crime. That's how we know something's deviant. If you go to another culture, uh, for example, in a culture that does honor killings, where um, someone might be expected to kill a family member, almost always a female family member who dishonors the family, um, it's not deviant. Not deviant by that culture's rules if people don't react to it. So I just want you to, to think about that because this is, when we talk about deviance, we're doing it in a non judgmental fact, fat, uh, factor or way. And what I mean here is that we're not actually saying that something is deviant um, because it's inherently deviant. Cultures define deviance, right? So where you live defines what is deviant. So, there's a couple of different things related to deviance. Crime is a particular type of deviance. Um, crime is, is any deviance uh, that has been written down into law. So, usually for the things that we as a society feel are most important, we'll write them down into a law. So, things like murder and stealing, those are all written down uh, in the laws. So, uh, you are a criminal if you break a law, which is just a particular type of deviance. Now, here's one that's really sort of interesting that I wanted to mention real quickly. Stigma. A stigma, stigma is when someone is deviant without doing anything. So, I mean, think about that for a second. One can be stigmatized if one breaks a norm of appearance. So, for example, you may have heard the term stigma associated with having a, a mental health disorder. Do people treat people differently because they have uh, a mental illness? They almost certainly do. That, that's not to say it's right. I personally don't believe it's right. But as a society, we treat people differently if they have mental illnesses or a physical disability. Um, so they are, by definition, by our official scientific definition, deviant because they are breaking a norm. And the norms that they're breaking, especially like a disability, is a norm of appearance. What's, it's ex what's expected for people to be, a normal way of being. Now, like I said, that doesn't make it right. I'm not saying and arguing that that's right or that people are deviant uh, in those cases. I'm saying that society treats people like they're deviant because they react to them like they are outside the norm or unusual. Um, so that goes back to this notion that deviance is not not something that is, um, it's a non-judgmental term. It's, it's really strictly related to how people are reacting to individuals when they do something. Um, also on stigma, think of someone, uh, if you have a family member who gets arrested for perhaps molesting a child. Um, the entire family is likely to be stigmatized even though they did nothing wrong themselves, even though they didn't do anything, but society looks at them like, oh, uh, you know, the apple couldn't have fallen too far from the tree, that sort of thing. So that's what I mean when I say a stigma. So um, just keep these terms in mind. Now what happens when someone is deviant? Well, to keep people in line, 
what we use are sanctions. These are methods of social control. So positive sanctions are rewards for following norms, so to keep people from not being deviant. So think of this, um, you go to work, you've got your job, and you do a good job at your job. What are some positive sanctions? What are some rewards that you might have? You might be thinking, uh, a raise. That's awesome. You know, if you get a raise, that's a positive sanction. It's rewarding you for following the rules or the norms. A negative sanction is a punishment. Right? It's a punishment for not following the rules, not following the norms. Um, in our society, that could be everything from uh, someone giving you a dirty look um, all the way up to the death penalty, uh, potentially. So there's all types of negative sanctions uh, and positive sanctions. So negative sanctions are punishments. Positive sanctions are rewards. So I want to jump ahead here. I'm going to hit all of these. Um, When we ask the question, why are people deviant? So, why do some people, and we're all deviant to some degree, I mean, we all break norms at some point, um, but why do people break norms? Why do people uh, go outside what is normal or usual in their society? And there's sort of three schools on this, and I just want to, this is not to toot sociology's own horn, but this is one of the cases where most people agree sociology does a pretty good job explaining why people are deviant. So, sociobiology really explores, as one explanation, it's really focused on the biology part here. Um, it really focuses on how um, our genetics or our biology relates to why we're deviant. So, perhaps there are things related to um, our genetics that may uh, make someone more deviant than someone else. Uh, we've seen connections to certain genetic disorders, um, intelligence, which has a strong genetic component, um, those sort of things. It, it may explain a s very small part of deviance, but it doesn't do a very good job, to be honest, explaining why most people are deviant. Psychology is another um, discipline that has come up with some answers as to why people are deviant. And, and I'll tell you where psychology is particularly good at. Psychology is particularly good at looking at why people are deviant, because this comes from inside, right? Just like sociobiology, it's, it has to do with the genetics. Psychology is inside. It has to do with what's going on in the mind. And it does a decent job of explaining some pretty extreme types of deviance. And what I mean, for example, is someone who is perhaps a serial killer. Um, uh, a serial killer would be a psychopath or a sociopath. Um, the terms are pretty much interchangeable. Those are things that are really related to having a personality disorder, which is related to psychology. It is something going on in the brain. Um, most serial killers, as we know now from our research, um, have experienced or uh, had symptoms going way back into early childhood. So this is something that is literally coming from within. I don't want to say it's sort of bad apple syndrome, but in some ways it kind of is. But those are sort of internal. And what I mean is it doesn't really matter what's going on as much in the environment. Um, it's more about what's going on inside uh, one, an individual. Now, sociology, I think, um, actually provides the best explanation for why people are deviant. And sociology essentially says this. People are deviant because of what goes on outside of them. In other words, external to them. And so remember uh, our chapter on socialization, which is simply how we learn our culture, how we learn the rules of behavior. Um, if something goes wrong there, of course, that explains why people might become deviant. So in other words, sociology focuses much more on how individuals are affected by the society and the environment around them. And um, most people, I think, agree that that is the primary root or cause of most deviance. So I'm going to show you a few theories. I'm not going to go into detail on, on all of them. Um, be sure to read through these in your text and, and get a good feel for them. But I do want to mention, you know, just so you can see how uh, sociologists actually view the inception of deviance. I was proud of this slide, by the way, because it was um, 
got these in the in the bullets, so thought it was pretty 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 awesome. Okay, so what do the perspectives say about deviants? Um, I'm going to give you a few here. Symbolic interactionists, uh, you know, which remember this is how we define situations and how we kind of as a small group interact with each other. Symbolic interactionists have a few theories related to deviants. I want to mention two in, in quick order. Um, differential association theory is one. And differential association theory is a pretty simple theory, actually. Differential association theory says from the different, notice it's in here, from the different people we associate with, we learn how to be deviant. In other words, deviance is learned directly from our interactions with uh, the people that matter to us. So take families, for example. If you grow up in a family where deviance is considered normal or accepted, it's very likely that you may learn how to be deviant. The same is true of growing up in particular neighborhoods where deviance becomes accepted. And I have a picture of Mike Tyson here um, because Mike Tyson tells a great story about how the neighborhood affected his, um, his who he became as an adult. And then subcultures or countercultures like gangs, of course, influence why people become deviant. So differential association theory just says we learn deviance from the different people we're associated with. All right, going back to symbolic interactionism again, I want to mention labeling because this is so important in our society and we've seen this happen over and over again. Labeling theory says that part of why people are deviant is because they become labeled as deviant. And what they mean by this is that people generally try to do the right thing but when someone makes a mistake and does something wrong, one of the worst things we can do is label them as something because oftentimes that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So just to give you an example, let's say that you um, are young and you make a mistake and you commit a crime and you get arrested and you get charged and convicted uh, as for a felony. You get a label for that. That label of felon is something that will follow you for the rest of your life. So every job application, I'm sure most of you have seen this, every job application has that question on there, are you a felon? It is very difficult to get rid of that label. And the label can oftentimes cause a person to continue to be deviant because they don't feel like they have any other opportunities. Um, it's why we got to be so careful with kids that when you correct behavior, you let kids know that the behavior is wrong, right? That you cannot do this behavior. Uh, but we got to be careful that we don't label kids as quote unquote bad uh, because th that creates a label that could become a self fulfilling prophecy. So um, if you need any more examples of labeling, just think back to high school because all of these cliques and all of these groups and how people are labeled. Um, for example, one that often comes up in class, and I don't really have time to talk about it here, but one that often comes up in class is how um, girls, uh, unfortunately, uh, based on our society's norms or rules, can be labeled as whores or as um, sluts or any of these sort of negative terms. And uh, that's an example of labeling theory kind of at the, um, you know, at the high school level that isn't necessarily breaking a law, but, you know, can have negative consequences on an individual. All right. So that's symbolic interactionism. It focuses on how we interact with other people and how um, that could lead to deviance. The second theory or second major perspective that you've learned about is functionalism, which says, what is the purpose, right? What is the purpose of things? And so for a functionalist, deviance must actually serve some purpose. That is, it must do something for society. And here are some of those functions of deviance uh, that um, functionalists have, have actually noticed over time. So one of the functions of deviance is that it clarifies moral boundaries and affirms norms. In other words, if no one was doing anything deviant, um, who, how would people know what the rules were? Right? So one of the things that happens is when someone gets arrested or commits a crime or does something deviant, 
what it serves is to to let everyone else know what the roles are what the roles should be and what you need to be doing so having that small percentage of a population that does something wrong actually keeps everyone else in line that's the theory of one of the functions of deviance another one is that deviance promotes social unity and what I mean by social unity is that it brings people together so think of when a horrible crime happens um, you know people who are very different who may have very different attitudes and perspectives but when a horrible crime happens like um, Kaylee and Casey Anthony what it tends to do is actually draw everyone else together right so people who are very different have different perspectives actually end up usually being on the same page and saying hey wait that's just so wrong so that's that idea of, of social unity and the last thing that deviance actually does is it actually allows things to change so it promotes social change and think about this uh, we see a lot of this in society right now we call these boundary violations boundary violations are um, issues or topics that were at one time deviant and are now moving into be considering normal or were at one time normal and now are moving into be to this category of deviant so what I'm saying here and I don't have it on the screen I wish I could show you this but but think of a, a like a line like a uh, there's a line and on one side you have like extreme deviance and on the other side you have extreme normal um, but so things like murder for example are way out in the extreme deviant category right so if you had a line like here it's going across here murder would be way over here right um, on the other side would be like extremely normal would be I don't know getting married or something most people get married at some point so that would be extremely normal but you know there's like a middle area where it's kind of on the the boundary or border of being both normal and deviant and so I'll give you an example uh, that we see a lot of right now two that come to mind one is medical marijuana so uh, an example here with marijuana um, as if you probably have been paying attention to the news it really depends on where you are in the country as to what the attitude towards marijuana is so for example if you are um, in Colorado or California or Michigan or some of the other states um, as far as for medical purposes marijuana is way over here right it's become quote unquote normal because the government has said it's okay to to, to do it um, if you're in Ohio, it's kind of over here, right? More on the deviant side because the government has not said it's okay to do it. But what we see over time is that it seems to be moving in the direction where marijuana seems to be seen more and more like alcohol, and it's moving over into the area of sort of normal. On the other side of the equation, or I should say another example of this is same-sex marriage or same-sex rights, um, something that was seen as deviant in the past and over time has moved and now we get to the point where it's certainly entering sort of normal territory as we see more and more states um, uh, passing laws that give uh, same-sex rights uh, equality rights and marriage in other regards so you see it sort of moving over time so deviants can actually promote social change sorry about this I got this my zoom's a little messed up here all right um, Strain theory is another good one. I'm not going to cover that right now, but I do want to mention the last one. Conflict theory um, conflict theory focuses on inequality. And so remember, conflict is about who has power and who doesn't. And what conflict theory really focuses in on is how deviance is defined by those who have power. And deviance... Um, people who don't have power that is the poor and the working classes are much more likely to be treated harshly than are those who have power and money and you've probably seen this I mean this doesn't take a genius to see um, you know ask yourself the question it does does money make a difference um, if you get charged with a crime and I think hopefully you can all you all have realized that the answer to that question is yes Right. I'd much rather have money uh, to hire a really great lawyer than to be poor and kind of get a public defender. Um, additionally, think about the crimes themselves. Um, if you're poor and you steal, you know that might be theft or it might be larceny or it might be you know any of the crimes related to to, to robbery. 
Um, but if you're wealthy and you steal, um, it's a whole different class of crimes. They call them white-collar crimes, and so it's things like embezzlement or um, insider trading. And what they generally say, or what conflict theorists argue, is that the rich and the powerful use the laws to control the poor and the working class. So uh, people are not actually more deviant because they are poor or working class, but they are treated like they are more deviant because those in power are the ones who control the laws and are the one who control society. So that's the argument that conflict theorists make. So anyways, just wanted to give you a basic introduction here to deviants. And so I hope that helps you a little bit and at least, you know, sends you on the right track as you uh, start reading about this in the text um, and reviewing the materials. So once again, have a great week out there.